thank you guys for having me. Uh, usually I'm one of the people that sit there and, and listen. So hopefully I can give you a couple of hinters on how you can work with your players on stress management. Um, obviously I played at a very high level and I've had many a stressful moments and um, didn't handle them that well at times, handled them very well at times. Um, but really sports psychology was not really there when I played. I played about 20 years ago. And even if there were sports psychologists around, you wouldn't really see them because it was still laden with a huge stigma. So I'm very, very happy uh, that players have now understood or are understanding more and more that mental skills is really part of your training, just like your, learn your athletic skills, your technical and tactical skills. Um, I want to add some to the things that I've, uh, that I've done. I also have formal training in uh, human and organizational behavior from Vanderbilt, which looks at human behavior in organizations. Um, I also have training in individual behavior modification uh, from Duke University. So I'm very happy that I can combine the two, um, adding the experiences that I have, knowing what it feels like um, to maybe not really be that great in stress management, and now being able to assist people in changing behaviors. Because most of the things that we do on the court, uh, bad body language, negative self-talk, uh, unable to be reframing negative statements that we tell ourselves. Those are the behaviors really that are detrimental to performance. And I'm hoping that I can give you a couple of strategies this morning that are very simple, yet not necessarily that easy to do uh, when you're under pressure. But uh, for a behavior to be changed, you have to become aware of what it is, number one. Uh, you have to know how it shows up for you individually, because we do all react a little differently under stress and you have to know what is triggered or what the triggers are that you actually get into your stress mode. So that's the first part of the presentation that I wanna show you. And then we'll go really into specific things that you can do for your players um, and or for yourself if you guys still compete because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, players that I think I recognize from pro-ams and so I'm, I'm thinking some of you guys are still also competing. So what is stress? And it's working. Thank you so much for, for being the hero here. So got a little stressed out there with uh, the presentation. Um, so the top one, you can read that for yourself. That's really the textbook definition for stress. The one that I'm working with when I work with athletes is the perception of the athlete that he or she does not have the capability of handling the situation. And it's really the important part here is the perception of the player. Whether you and I as coaches from the outside see something totally different doesn't make any different to what the player perceives so in other words I have for instance I have a little guy who's about 10 years he has not had his growth spurt yet and he gets out hit by big players is what he thinks so when he gets on the court with a bigger guy 12 year old um, guy that is maybe as tall as I'm he goes immediately into "Ooh, I can't hit I, I can't win against this guy right? it's his perception whether you and I from the outside then see, well, you're faster than he is, that guy is full in his growth spurt and he's running around like a newborn giraffe and he can't move, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's what he thinks that forms his reality. Uh, one thing about stress, as humans, we do not like uncertainty. We do not like being thrown into situations that are unpredictable. And I think that's a pretty good summation of a tennis match. Right? You never know what's gonna happen because there's a ton of factors that we have not under control. There's factors that we should have under control. So just to illustrate that, um, I tried to put that into a very roady kind of, uh, wavy kind of street there, a road, kind of tough road ahead. Um, I looked at my playing records um, recently, and I remembered that none of my matches were ever going straight. There's tons of ups and downs in matches. Uh, even in points, you have momentum changes. You think that you're in control in a match, and then all of a sudden, two games later, you're absolutely, everything's turned around. Uh, so I remembered matches where I had external factors that I couldn't control, of course. Heat, uh, played in snow drifts. Uh, I played on clay courts that were poorly maintained somewhere in Bulgaria, where they were drawn the lines with chalk in the morning. Um, I played uh, at Wimbledon where it was super hot one day and then the next day it was <coughs> kind of humid and the conditions changed. And if you don't know how to let that go, if you let that influence you, it will definitely change how you think and how you feel. Um, so a couple more of those 
external factors. I mean, I tried to kind of encompass our situation here in, in Atlanta with a lot of team play. You have no, absolutely zero control over what your team does. I, I get that a lot from the ladies that I work with at uh, Piedmont. I'm still teaching there. <coughs> well, the other team cheated. They were loud. There were, uh, I don't know, there was a playground next to us. And I, I couldn't concentrate. Uh, you know, Susie and Peggy, hopefully there's no Susies and Peggy's here. Um, <laughs> Susie and Peggy, they got into a, a shouting match with their opponents because they had a dispute over the score. And that distracted me. Um, I hear that from when I am actually watching players. They don't like that I watch for whatever reason. They think maybe they have to impress me. I'm not quite sure. Uh, when Who of you guys is working with juniors? So for our players there, huge distracting factor are the parents. And that's another presentation that we can do at another time. Uh, so those are definitely things that will influence how you think and how you react to certain things. Um, and by the way, both of these things, your mind and your body, they're interconnected. So how your mind is perceiving something, how you process certain cues, whether they're relevant or irrelevant, will make you feel a certain way. How you feel will absolutely make you think in a certain way. Um, so to all those outside factors, and of course then you have your opponent. You know, whatever shenanigans they're into, if they're cheating, if they're stalling, if they're being coached by their coach, which is not allowed, uh, whatever it is, those are things that you have no, no control over, absolutely zero control over. But looking back at my playing record, I know that I let myself be influenced by a lot of those things, and I didn't know how to handle it necessarily. Um, so one thing that I really like to get across this morning is that I can give you some how-tos. Because when I played, I got great and oftentimes useless advice. Um, why don't you just stay positive, Micah? Okay, I just lost five first rounds. I can't get a ball on the court. Tell me how to stay positive. So that's really easy. We're given that advice, but we're not giving our players the how-tos. So I'm hoping that I can give you a couple of how-tos this morning. Uh, the factors that we should have under control, and I'm doing this here, of course, um, what we think how we think about things, what we perceive, our emotions. Uh, we have fears, we have worries. We don't make an, want to make an idiot out of ourselves out there. We don't want to look bad against uh, our friend that we beat in drills all the time. Uh, we want to convince coach that I need to play at a higher lineup or my captain and alpha ladies. Hopefully no alpha ladies here. <laughs> Always getting in trouble with that one. Um, my, ex my own expectations, expectations of coaches, teammates, parents, most of them are really the detrimental ones are my own expectations. So I'm, I'm very good without any of these other factors and beating myself up, we all are. So that's just to illustrate that you have factors and potential stressors that will influence how your body uh, functions for you and how your mind works for you. And combined of all of these, I think a lot of times we're not really preparing our players what kind of reigns in on them when they start competitive tennis and or any sport. Um, and going back to this, this is very interesting to me. I also work with people that have nothing to do with athletics. And you could substitute a lot of these things with uh, boss, coworkers, uh, Work, in, uh, work environment, <coughs> so we all uh, react under stress in a very, very similar way. So what I want to do with you guys, uh, who is still competing? Well, what do we call competing at this point? Well, being on a team, being in, in potentially stressful athletic situations. Okay, so just go ahead and uh, think back to the last time when you had a stressful match, when you had a tight match. Or for instance, other, other instances in your life, going into a uh, job interview, uh, having to publicly speak. I mean, I'm stressed out like crazy right now. <laughs> uh, so what are some things that you physically felt? Can you think back, what were some of the physical presentations of stress? So your sweating. stomach hurts a little bit? Yep. Sweating. Sweating, sweating, sweating. <laughs> sweating. good. What else? Tight muscles. Yeah, muscular tension. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yep. We, yep. I don't know what yours. I don't. <laughs> the smoking part. Uh, what else? What are some other things? Butterflies. Butterflies. Okay. 
And this is, those are the signs that you start to pick up on when you know what you're mm -hmm. looking for. So you have to know what triggers them. Um, specifically when you work with uh, younger kids, some, something like butterflies. Um, I have one, I actually work with younger kids uh, from age six, seven, and eight on. And they may not be um, actually able to verbalize, well, muscular tension. Uh, they're not able to verbalize, my heart rate goes up. So maybe you can ask questions like, what do you feel? Well, my tummy is hot. I have that. I'm, I mean, I actually have a couple of kids that throw up before competition at age 9, 10, which is rather dramatic, I think. Um, so you want to help them with questions. But all of you guys hit on exactly the physical signs that humans experience when they're under stress. So I think we, did anybody say anything about breathing? What happens when we get stressed out? We start to breathe really rapidly. Um, so your heart rate increases, your blood pressure goes up, and all of that is because your brain actually shuns blood away to support those functions. And the worst thing that can happen then is that we lose the capability to actually think rationally. And a lot of times you hear that when somebody is really in the throes of a tight third set, oh, he's a hothead. Or she was, I was blind with rage. I was so mad I couldn't think straight. Right? And instead of us kind of going like, well, you should have, maybe that helps us to be a little bit more compassionate. Because I certainly was in those situations where my coaches literally slapped their heads after the matches and said, like, why did you not do whatever needed to be done? It's like, I didn't see it. I was so in it, I did not see it. I mean, I give you one example. I played Mary Pierce in 1998, and uh, we were pretty even Steven in the third set. I twisted, um, had an injury timeout, and that totally took my focus away and went back to playing her backhand again, which everybody at that point knew arguably probably one of the better backhands on the tour at that time. Instead of working her forehand, how I had gotten to the third set. So that happens. And of course, my coaches were sitting out there going like, what the heck are you doing out there? <laughs> so, but that happens. Um, what are some mental signs of stress? What do you notice in yourself? What do you have you noticed? With players, physical signs of frustration. They're going. Oh. <laughs> they yep. The yep. They check out and I'm trying not anymore. Yep. Speeding up. Perfect. I mean, not perfect. Unfortunately, that happens, but that's exactly what happens. Um, so yeah, loss of focus. So and I think again, that's an opportunity for us to be a little bit more compassionate instead of going like focus, yelling into the whenever they're playing they may not have the tools to deal with that. They may not know what to do when all of a sudden everything else becomes more important rather than watching what's going on on the tennis court. So you have loss of focus. Uh, some of the kids describe it as fuzzy brain, cloudy brain. You don't see the forest for all the trees anymore. You're starting with poor shot selection. Right? You played a certain way, you had a certain game plan that got you up into a tight situation and all of a sudden you're totally getting away from it. Uh, last year I worked with uh, the Georgia Tech women's team and they have one particular player that has beautiful, beautiful ground strokes and can dictate pretty much any match. And that's how she got in very, very good matches with very high level players. I don't want to say inevitably, but a lot of times when she got into tiebreakers or finishing out sets, all of a sudden she starts playing serve and volley. All of a sudden she starts throwing drop shots in. Not one time had she done that to get to that point, but all of a sudden, she wants to finish the point really quickly, starting to slap winners from 18 feet behind the baseline. If you pull them off the court and you ask them, they would of course tell you that those are stupid decisions. But at that moment, we're trying to do two things when we're trying to shorten points. We actually literally want to get away from an uncomfortable <coughs> position, and we want to get to the next point quickly to do it better. So it's, I want to fix it, and I want to run away. Um, the rushing between points, same thing. Um, and it is stunning, again, going back to you want to know what the behavior looks like and what your behavior is. I time players, and I go like, did you take your full 20 seconds? And they go like, oh, yeah, sure, I did. Then, well, let me <coughs> time you. And it's barely six or seven seconds. So, again, it's the perception of the player that counts what defines reality at that point. And um, I don't know who, who saw that. Did you guys <laughs> see that? Um, I, unfortunately, this is played up in the media a little bit too much, so I actually have players going like, oh yeah, Serena does it, and, and Djokovic does it, and I'm just like, yeah, that's, that's true. But I think the only point that I want to use there is to demonstrate that the top players have the same emotions as us. 
Um, and this, we're, we're sponsored by Prince these days, right, as the youth PTA, Ken? Mm -hmm. Okay, so no Wilson representative here? Okay, because I'm pretty sure they're still kind of celebrating the day that I retired, because um, <laughs> I probably have it. Yeah, I, I got dozens of records sent per year. So on that note, um, all the things that we described is your presentation of a gazillion year old biological response, your fight or flight response, or now these days we are other call it stress response. Um, anybody heard of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so everybody goes, mm -hmm, been there, been there, done that. Um, so that is hardwired into our brain. You cannot help that it will happen. <coughs> it will help if you know what could trigger <coughs> your blood pressure. It will help to know how to prepare for it, and that's what we're going to get into it. Um, it will help to know that it's something that everybody experiences. Um, again, when I played, I felt helpless a lot of times because I didn't know that this was a very human reaction. Uh, coming now, coming back and actually talking to a lot of players of my, my generation, I have to say that dramatic. Um, of course, we never talked about it when we played because you wouldn't um, admit that you had any kind of weaknesses, but it's amazing how very little any of us was prepared to compete at such a high level. And I just uh, recently talked to Marianne Burdell, then um, I'm still in touch with, with Dutch players and Austrian players. They described all of that to the T. And we all went through this. And none of us were given the right tools, unfortunately, which it's very simple actually to counter, but if you don't know what it is, it can feel extremely painful on the court. So again, something for us to be maybe a little bit more compassionate with our players. Um, so fleeing, we're fighting. Since you can't punch anybody, uh, unfortunately, we're mostly choosing the running away. So that's the speeding up part. Um, the ideal curve of arousal, right? We have to be a little nervous. It's okay to be nervous. So when I work with younger kids um, and they come to me and say like, hey, I have butterflies, it's okay, right? Tell them that it's okay, it's normal. You have to care. I mean, you have to be nervous to care a little bit. Um, most of us, and that's why I address more this area here, most of us will fall to the right side of the ideal state. We're getting into our anxiety reactions. We're getting into our stress reactions. And hopefully now, um, and this will be on your handout, um, there are a couple of the, the pointers that you can see. Maybe my player is a little bit more in a stressed out reaction. Here's what I can do. Um, so I address a little bit more of the right side. If you have people that are falling to the left, uh, you may see yawning. You may see listlessness. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we interpret that as uh, they're not trying. But again, they may not have had the tools to actually find their, their ideal level of activation. So I'm going to address a little bit more uh, the right side of the curve. Uh, any questions so far? I want to make sure that everybody gets what kind of have wisdoms on <laughs> Kind of sharing. No, th this is all scientifically based. So this, this I didn't come up with it, <coughs> most of that. So, world class players, college players, they all prepare for <coughs> matches. Very often, I see that. Of course, our regular clients, they come from either their office, uh, they come from any kind of other activities. If you guys work with juniors, you may have players that come right from uh, school and they may not be completely focused. They still have the baggage of whatever happened prior to coming on the tennis court. You want to help them prepare. And that is maybe a little hard to do if you have regular Alta clients. You may have to do the preparation with them to show it. I mean, I'm running around with six-year-olds or seven, eight-year-olds to show them what I mean. Um, and it's always good to see if your coach does what you're actually preaching. So if you are having underactivated people, and this I think I'm, I gave that a little <coughs> bit more toward uh, younger kids that come from school and are a little tired, yeah. you want to physically get them going. You want the heart rate to go up, right? You can do that jogging, everybody does the dynamic stretching, so that's really good. Um, get some music going, right? I don't think it really distracts them, it gets them focused a little bit more. You want them to forget about the stuff that happens before. Uh, cold water in your face always helps, I find. Um, if you're overactivated, meaning nervous, and this is when people may uh, tell you, wow, I really have butterflies, <coughs> um, I'm shaking. I had a, uh, I think she started out, C9 lady uh, report to me before her first ever Alta match that she was so nervous that she couldn't drink because she was shaking that hard. So probably it would have helped her 
to just jog slowly. And what I mean by that, it's really a pedal jog, <coughs> right? With little kids, we call that loosey-goosey jog. So just shake everything loose, try to prevent that muscular tension. Deep breathing. Um, I think at Lifetime, uh, I'm the mental skills coach for Lifetime as well as for the regional training center there. Uh, I've given all my kids these here. It says breathe. And I think behind my back, they actually call me Breathing Babs. Um, <laughs> that's my nickname. Uh, but breathing will help you in most all of your stress situations. Deep breathing. And it's very ridiculous that we're talking about, well, breathing. Well, we need it to sustain life. I mean, all of you guys know how to breathe very obviously. But there are more specific ways to breathe when you're under pressure. <coughs> um, I'm stressing this a lot with the athletes that I work with. Uh, have a kinder attitude. <coughs> uh, sometimes I'm actually wondering why I'm calling myself a mental toughness expert, because I find it's actually a lot more helpful if you're a little bit more compassionate with yourself. If you could teach people a little bit more compassion toward themselves and others, I think they would actually compete a lot better. So your warm up is not there to judge your performance. Your warm up is there, and I mean the warm up that you hopefully have maybe 30 minutes before your match, especially again if you're working with juniors, but also stress with your regular adults. See if you can get a hit in before you get on the court. Don't use the five, 10 minutes to warm up physically. That should be the time when you either scout your opponent or you're really kind of trying to draw up your own mental skills. So have a kinder attitude, warm up physically. That's all you want to accomplish. Uh, PMR, and of course you can uh, kind of put the uh, Barry White, is it Barry White? <laughs> is that Barry White? Don't do that. <laughs> so the uh, progressive muscle relaxation, PMR, um, it's getting a little outside the scope of this workshop, but if you're interested, you can email me and I can give you some literature. It's very easy to do. You can read the script for your players. I have my own, uh, the players uh, read their own scripts and just speak it into <coughs> their phones. They can listen to it at any point. Um, so that's, that's a very good thing to, to do before matches. Um, what do you think? Uh, humans don't like unpredictability. Humans do not like situations that they have no control over. So what options do we have on the court when we're playing our match to impose some control over the factors that technically we should have control over? What are your thoughts? Because everybody has heard about them. Everybody knows what to do. What, what lends me stability and safety, a go-to in between points? Do solid routine between points? Yes. Thank you. So what do they do? Why do we do routines? And I think the, the vanguard really in that was everybody knows the 16 seconds <coughs> cure, uh, Dr. Jim Lur, and a lot of that is based on that because he has the science to back all this up. So what routines really want to do, um, and we'll go into that very specifically, you want to accomplish a few <coughs> things. Number one, you want to let the last point go. And I'm telling you, I've, I don't know how many matches I struggled with that. I missed balls five, six points later, five, six games later. Uh, I remember one distinct uh, match I played in at the French Open, I had set point against Anke Huber, a fellow German, and uh, <coughs> I blame ASICs for that. My hand got caught up, it was very windy, my hand got caught up in my skirt, believe it or not. And of course I shanked the set point. And the second set was over in about two minutes because I was still so cheesed off about that that I could not let go of it. I mean, I, yeah, my coaches were again, it's like, well, so yeah. uh, I was not very easy to coach, just, <laughs> just that. Um, the second thing that you wanna do is you wanna relax. And it's very easy for us to say, just relax. Again, we have to give our players the how-to, and we'll get into that in a second. Refocusing, being able to play the next point with full focus, full energy, and the belief to win the next point, that I can do it. And the belief to win the next point may just start with, I am gonna serve out wide to set out my forehand. Just knowing exactly what I wanna do with my next movement is good enough. And that hopefully will help us to control what we have control over, which is our mind, and our body. Everything else, we should hopefully be able to let go of. Yes? I have a question here. Um, many times when I'm playing, when I'm coaching, I see my players, like they go up 15 love, they go up 30 love. And then, like they'll kind of take the, take, the, take the foot off the gas at 30 love. Mm -hmm. And maybe hit a double fall, 30 15, and now, instead of being 40 love and almost a hold, now it's 30 15, and we're working much harder than we should have. What's a good strategy for keeping the, you know, the pedal to the metal at 30 love? 
that would be the refocusing. I mean, that's basically where they need to go, like, how did I win the first two points and still do that? But taking the foot off the gas is kind of like, oh, I'm just going to cruise into the, the finish line there. Yeah. So that would be the work with the refocus. Okay. So here's your basic routine. Um, and who knows the 16 seconds cure? I'm pretty Okay, it's not that many actually, okay, good. Uh, which I'm not sure why they call it 16 seconds here if we have 20 seconds in between, but um, the easiest thing, you try to break it down into the easiest possible ways for your players to remember. So instead of the 16 seconds cure, which had five, six distinct phases, um, this is what the USDA is using now. This is what we're teaching uh, children 12 and up, right? Because they can actually intellectually grasp all of this. With kids under 12, I would keep it to two things, the double Bs, breathe and believe. You, I don't know if you heard that, uh, Melanie O'Down, that was basically her mantra when she made her run in the 2009 US Open. Was that? So it's breathing and believe for the little ones. You gotta teach them how to breathe. The believe is just one little affirmative statement, as in let's go, I can do this, uh, here we go, whatever it is for the younger ones. For the older ones, you wanna get them into this routine and you want them to do that every single time because it has to become ingrained. It has to become second nature. That's the definition of habit. Your brain will not have to exert any energy to show a certain behavior. So the first thing that you want, obviously, is a response. You want a neutral or a positive response. And that should also be on your handout, by the way. Um, it, is that, does everybody have those uh, <coughs> flash drives? Yeah. Or is the handout in there somewhere? Oh. Okay, good. Oh, there you go. There's the master. So your first response should be a neutral one, at least a neutral one, if not a positive one. But we all know that if we just lost a point, it's very difficult <coughs> to show good body language. So the first thing that you want to teach your, your players, any player, is to turn away, to physically turn away from what has just happened. Right? So you literally want to signal yourself, <coughs> done. The point is in the past. And you see the top players turn around. Teach them to do that maybe with a hop skip. Right? We had a guy at Vanderbilt when I coached there that we called hop skip boy because he would do that every time. Mm -hmm. People were making fun of him, but he had a great playing record because you literally could not tell whether he was winning or losing. Right? So turn away from the court. Positive body language, or at least neutral, is a very expansive body language. Right? I don't want to have my shoulders back. I want to have a straight back. I want to have my chin up. This here signifies defeat. Right, and of course, you all know, if I'm seeing somebody across the net doing that, what does that do to me? Power. Yeah. yeah. It helps my confidence, right? So the last thing that I want to do after losing a point is fueling my opponent's confidence. So that's your number one. The number two, if you want to get into that, your racket should go into your non-dominant hand to allow blood flow into your muscles. So that way you're preventing muscular tension. And here we come into our specific way of breathing. So there's different way, uh, names for it. Uh, some do it with a cycle of three, five, four, five, military breathing. What it is really, you teach your players to take one big deep breath in to the count of four. And it's a count of four, it's not seconds. So you take a, count, uh, a breath in, one, two, three, four, and you release to one, two, three, four, five. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five. If I did that with you, I'd put you to sleep. So I'm not going to do that. Um, for younger kids, they may not necessarily want to count. Teach them how to belly breathe. Or your adult, same thing. So put your hand on your belly and try to make a big fat Buddha belly. That's what we call it. So you really have your diaphragma uh, diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, chest breathing is fine too. Get them to breathe slowly and deeply. However you do that, <coughs> perfectly fine. Uh, this method is pretty good if you count along, because contrary to the myth that we all propagate, our brain is not very good in multitasking. So if I can occupy my brain with counting, it has less of a chance to get into your negative chatter. So just by counting, you can prevent some of that. You're refocusing, and this would be uh, something for your player maybe to go like keep going, keep playing, do whatever you need to do. Um, keep your eyes on your strengths. Try to keep your eyes contained, because our eyes are our number one sensory intake organ. So <coughs> anytime I'm looking at something, <coughs> my mind actually starts to attach stories. Um, I just recently had a, again, a younger kid 
uh, eight or nine, I think he is, and he looked very unfocused to me, so I went up to him and said, hey, buddy, what's going on? You look a little distracted, and he's going like, well, somebody over there has a bag of Cheetos. I'm really hungry, and I want to have lunch. I wonder what's what for lunch, and he kind of literally walks away from me as he's talking. <laughs> I was like, wow, you're probably not that focused right now. So <laughs> keep those eyes anywhere on a focal point, right? The string, that's why you really see players do that. They don't have to mess with their strings, really. Um, then you get into your ready part, and that's a lot of times what coaches tell players, yeah, it's the bouncing of the balls. Again, it's a focal point. Your brain is occupied. Um, but it's just a part of the entire routine, right? And your return routine could be just getting low, activating your feet. You can do Marion Bartoli. Um, try not to teach your players the butt picking of Nadal. <laughs> um, but that's really what they're doing. All those routines are an attempt of humans to control their environment. Right? I'm kind of thinking with Nadal, it's a little over <coughs> here already. Um, but the funny thing is he does that in practices actually too. So he's, he's really uh, perfected that. So I have two <laughs> clips for you guys. Um, one is Maria Sharapova, who I know of, that she was taught that when she was little. And she does that every time. Uh, the second one is Federer. And um, just as you're watching, see in your mind if you can go along and see if you can find the components there. So I'm hoping that I'm not messing this up here. If we watch that again, you can see, I don't know what happened in the previous point, but you see that she's got great body language, right? She's fiddling with the strings, actively walks away from the court, and she does that every time, every single time. It's the bouncing of the ball, so that little hops, and she does her hair that I think Noah Djokovic made fun of. <laughs> and again, very deliberate bounce, ba ball bouncing. Normally two. And I don't think that this was any big match, right? I think that was, uh, it looks like it was at Stanford maybe, I can't even tell who the player is, but she does it no matter what, right? Of course she's gonna do it even more and more concentrated when she has bigger matches. But that is definitely something that she, uh, that she was taught. So let's look at the master himself. He shows a very positive reaction right there. <coughs> also very deliberate. Uh, and both of those clips are online. I think the, or if you want to email me, I can share them with you. Uh, I think the Sharapova one is under Sharapova and serve routine, and I think it is Federer 16 seconds clip, <coughs> because that, that is Dr. Lur's uh, performance institute. Mikey? Yeah. Do you find that pl players are having a more difficult time on the return of serve, having their, pat uh, their routine? Obviously serve is easy because you yeah. have the ball in your hand. Yeah. So one thing that I'm trying to teach uh, players is start to focus in on the ball in the player's hand that's about to serve. And then no one, if they have to activate or maybe even calm down, whatever it is there. But yeah, absolutely. Because you have, yeah, you have an activity basically when you bounce the ball. But yeah, don't, don't teach them the Marion Bartoli. <laughs> that, that was always, or anybody remember Zena Garrison? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I included this here. Uh, because that is something that most players have issues with, closing something out, whether it's a game, a set, or a match, right, when it's crunch time. So by now, if we've taught our players correctly, they know that they want to speed up when it gets tough. They know that they want to take less time in between points. So counteract that by slowing down and breathe, right? 
players have this here. I have players that have it on the inside of their hat. They have it on the inside of their rackets, on the throat, something breathe. Whatever their cue word is that will remind them to do their uh, routine. Do your routine, do it twice. Right, I'd rather have a player get a point, I'm not a point penalty necessarily, but a warning for uh, using too much time than cooperating into a loss by rushing. Um, so these are the ones that you always hear from coaches. Stay in the present, play one point at a time. So you now know how to do those things. You will stay in the present if you breathe, if you occupy your brain with counting and or analyzing real quick what won me the last point or what lost me the last point and what do I have to do differently instead of going into that I suck and I shouldn't play tennis and all the other things that we hear when we, uh, when we see players play. I know this sounds extremely <coughs> simplistic. When nothing else works, when you're about to completely choke, <coughs> this is the way to go. This strategy just won Vanderbilt Women's uh, Tennis, the national championship this past uh, May. Uh, that's where I went to, uh, that was my second coaching uh, stint in the SEC. And it won us a ton of matches. Right? We had tons of players that would not be able to close out matches because you have, it's 3-3, three, three, comes down to your match, and they're about to choke. They know it, that's how you do it. So you go with the simplest game plan, putting one more point in through the court, one more ball into the court, play the inner third of the court with a cross court direction, high margin, and a high first ser serve percentage. And that actually won them the championship this year, which is great, but you'd be wondering at what high of a level that easy of a game plan will actually still win you matches. So I think if they can use it, it will serve all of us pretty well. One very neglected part of <coughs> stress management is the after the match part. Um, as opposed to your stress response, the relaxation response is not triggered. You have to actively engage in it. Right? Your body will come down some, but your body will actually still feel like a, a motor that you constantly rev up. And you see that a lot of times when people have just won, you have emotions that exuberance, giddiness, uh, people are laughing, but they're really not coming down. And of course, if somebody is lost, you have negative emotions. People are crying, angry, whatever it is. Um, there is still a lot going on in your body. And if you want to prevent chronic stress, and this is also for, for us as coaches, if you just want to tear your hair up because somebody's not learning what you want them to learn, or you have unreasonable demands uh, made by your membership, looking at all the club manager. Uh, this is what you want to engage in. So again, it's that slow shuffle jog. And I think uh, other sports are light years ahead of tennis there. Um, I'm from Europe. I uh, grew up playing soccer. I grew up playing field hockey. And that's what the teams engage in. After matches, they have their five, 10 minutes, little piddle jog going on. Then they gently stretch. They drink a lot to just flush out all the waste stuff. Right? You have tons of hormones, uh, testosterone. You have cortisol raging when you're playing adrenaline, they all leave waste in your cells. You want to flush them out, right? not just the physical part, but up here too. Uh, one phenomenal tool that I kind of think is probably on, the, on its way out because everybody's just texting and kind of typing uh, is journaling. It's a great tool. Let your kids or whoever you train journal if it's just writing that's fine on, on the computer that's fine too I'd rather have them do it in handwriting because they have to structure their thoughts a little bit more let them just journal about their experience uh, with older kids I let them free journal with kids that want to um, that are good writers that want to write I let them free journal what's your experience what happened what did you do well what did you not do well what do you want to do differently uh, for younger kids I have a template so they're basically just ex um, answering questions but it's a phenomenal way for them to get rid of emotions. It's for their, their eyes only, or mine, and mine, not their parents. Um, it's also a great learning tool because it gives them black on white or blue on white or whatever they print it out on, that they have had success dealing with adversity. If they didn't, they can go back and see what did I do and what can I do differently next. So it's a great way to actually chart progress for them. And it's very interesting if you go back, I went back to my journals um, I found them when my mom just recently moved, what kind of stuff I wrote in there. And it's, 
yeah, it's mind-boggling what kind of things go through your head when you actually compete. So this is all the theory. Now we're getting mm -hmm. into the stuff that you can actively do. Uh, who of you guys love teaching <coughs> serves? Going from the frying pan grip to a continental grip. <laughs> hey, uh, tell me about your experiences with that. Let's say we're, we're teaching a, a child. Let's go with a child, a reasonably athletic child. Comes to you with a frying pan grip. Tell me about the progress. They're usually not one to do it because they're not successful. Yep, so you have some resistance in the beginning. What else? What do you have to do as coach? Lower your expectations. I want to Lower expectations. How do you actually manage to teach them the uh, the skill? You have to go through progressions. Progressions. Tell me more about that. They start very simple, and if they can be successful, just show them the next step. Yeah. So that's basically the formula for skill acquisition, and all of the mental skills. And that's the beautiful thing about this. All mental skills follow the exact same patterns as any other skill that you will learn in your life. Uh, whether it's learning a musical instrument, whether it's learning a language, or the dreaded switch from a frying pan grip to your continental grip. It goes through tons of repetitions, tons of reminders from your coaches to always use it. It goes through levels of frustration. It goes through levels of where you're getting confident at some stages, and then later on, hopefully, from practice to match play to turn on play, that you're actually not ever having to think about what grip you're using. And that's the progression that you're using with your <coughs> mental skills as well, at least for the routines. Um, and that should also be in your handout. What you want to do is when you start with adversity training, you don't have to necessarily call it that, but it's, it's always a fancy schmancy word, I think. It's you have to let your players know that this is what you work on because you can't just randomly start them, uh, throw them into that. What you want to do is you want to create a safe environment, meaning that you give them the tools to problem solve. So you're not just throwing them out there and let them have to deal with adversity by themselves. You let them know that you will intentionally raise the level of frustration, but you're there to guide them through. Right? So the first one is really easy. Uh, start them at the service line. And you can manipulate that according to level of play. You can have them slice everything. You can have them go cross court. You can have them roll everything, whatever you want to do uh, to accommodate their level of play. When either player misses, both of them have to give you a sprint to the net and back. Or if you have more athletic players, to the back fence and back. Like you don't want to do that with 60 year olds necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, what you do in there is you create frustration in both. Of course, you create frustration in the person that misses the ball. You also uh, create frustration in the person that has to run even though they did not miss the ball. You're also getting the heart rate up. So the first task is keep a neutral body language. Demonstrate it as coach. Right? A lot of times I'm seeing that, unfortunately, that I don't have my cell phone here, but people are doing this. Hmm. That's also not something that you want to show them. You want to show them good, expansive body language and explain that you're modeling it to them. Right? Shoulders back, head up. Do that a bunch of times and you'll hear verbal outbursts, uh, again, really dude, keep the ball in play, that kind of stuff. But that's what you want to do, you want to force errors. Have them go through the routine, or part of the routine. The next one is move your players back to the baseline. Again, you can adjust for level of play. So for instance, I was very privileged to, to work with the women's tennis team at Vanderbilt a couple of weeks ago, and we literally had to go three by three targets, because otherwise they wouldn't miss. Um, but you heard the same reactions. Really, geez, can't keep the ball in play, stuff like that. Make them run, get their heart rate up, and then in the second round here, they have to go through the full routine. And you will have some resistance in the beginning. They go like, why do I have to do that? Is everybody doing this? What, what does this lady tell me? What does she know? And this goes to me. And I had literally one play, it's like, really? Um, so that was always interesting. Have them do it every time. Since I was there visiting with them, they've done it every time in practices, and coach has reported that the level of intensity has gone up, the level of focus has gone up, because they come into their practices with the right intentions. They know that they're given the time to deal with frustration, and I think that's a very important thing, because a lot of times we kind of, I'll get back in line and get ready for the next ball. We don't give them the time to actually deal with it. So, 
ask your players, ask questions, how and what? How did you feel? What did you do to get less frustrated? Try not to necessarily start questions with why didn't you? That always puts people on the defense. So ask them, start an open conversation. Interrupt practices and ask them, what are you gonna do when you're frustrated? How are you gonna deal with that? What do you feel right now? Because what I'm saying, they might hear completely different. Right? I wanna learn their terminology. When, for instance, a player goes like, yeah, I'm getting really fuzzy in my brain. I wanna know what that player means and not me think, well, your capabilities is to think intellectually have been decreased just now. That's not gonna happen with a 10-year-old. And then once you've run through this, and this should not take you longer than 10, 15, 20 minutes, you can start with the real stuff. Um, and I didn't group that together in any kind of particular order, but they're just manipulating or manipulations that will definitely increase the level of frustration. Um, my favorite is the playing with bad balls. Right? Get the crappy balls out. Yeah, everybody wants to play with new balls, but in a third set, in a humid Georgia summer, those balls are that big, you can't hit through the court anymore. You can't hit the, ball, uh, the kid off the court anymore. You have to do something differently. Are you aware that the situation has just changed on you or slowly changed <coughs> for you? Ask them, what do you want to do? How can you adjust to that instead of just whining and complaining that you don't have new balls? You don't maybe want to put it that harshly as I can say. Um, but ask them, how are you going to problem solve? Because one other thing that I'm thinking uh, is we don't teach our players enough to problem solve on their own. Um, I'm hearing a lot of instructions giving where people are asking, coaches are asking questions, but they kind of give the answer right away. Ask, get their information. I mean, I was stunned with uh, working at a cross-sectional camp, I think it was called, with 10, 11, 12 year olds. If you can interrupt the immediate negative response, I suck, I'm bad, I can't do this, and you ask them questions, what do you just did wrong? What, what do you think was something that you could do differently? They know the answers. But if they literally do not allow themselves to come up with the solution, they're not gonna then put it in action. So give them that space where they can come up with, with answers. Um, these two here are also favorites, the random overrule and the re random replaying of the point uh, for juniors, which unfortunately happens apparently a lot that uh, Referees come in at a very inopportune time. They're only seeing the eighth time that somebody cheats and then they don't overrule or they overrule at times when they should have overruled. Uh, whatever happens, this seems to be the number one that juniors report to me, that there's a lot of cheating going on. There's a lot of random refereeing. Uh, and I'm not uh, blaming the referees. I, I wouldn't want to deal with the kids, to be honest, um, on the court. So those are great little helpers there. And you have to, of course, announce it, right? I have, I'm the coach, I'm the referee, my word um, counts. If I see any kind of questionable calls, I will overrule. Even if they're not questionable, those calls. I, I did that um, recently at Lifetime with, with older kids and they should be able to overcome that. And I overruled the ball that was that far in. Outcome wasn't that great after that with the <laughs> mental game. So, but that's an opportunity for them to learn because it's still a very safe environment, right? Nothing's going to happen if they lose that match, hopefully. Um, so you can manipulate in any kind of way that you can think of, and I'm pretty sure that, that people have other ideas uh, still that I didn't put in there. Have your players go through the routine every single time. I cannot stress enough how much you have to do that in practices to be ready to actually use it in matches. Even with the players that I have uh, that do it in practices all the time, if I don't see them for two, three, four, five weeks, they come back and say, yeah, I think my routine broke down a little bit. Mm, okay, I thought that was ingrained already. So don't let them get away with not doing it. Um, of course, you don't have to expand the routine if things go well. Right, you want to actually rather shrink them down a little bit when you're up and you're rolling. But definitely when it's crunch time, you do want to go through your routines. Because you do want to create that space right, in which you literally put time and physical space between you and the negative uh, exposure that you just had by losing a point so that you can actually choose a different behavior. Because the behaviors that we're so prone to, the letting our shoulders drop, slamming a racket, verbal outburst, they're learned behaviors. 
They're literally learned behaviors. I work with athletes in other sports. They don't show those behaviors. A volleyball kid will not slump that much. Because guess what, when that happens, they get them substituted out right away. But in tennis, it's so normal to have younger kids play, I mean, have them on the court next to older kids. I've not heard in any other walk of life say a six-year-old, are you serious after losing a point? <laughs> so, or, oh, you suck, seven-year-old. I mean, you don't see that. So give them the time and space. And of course, you can use all that stuff with your more advanced chronologically and or skill-wise players. Um, I think that concludes it. Uh, and I hope that I gave you a couple of pointers that you can hopefully make your players mentally more compassionate. Uh, so if you have any questions. Is there, is there any time that you would, because I know players have, you know, tend to go through their routines, but is there ever any player that you would recommend that they have outbursts, that they, that they show energy, you know? If they're able to let it go immediately, yes. Um, if I'm judging by my own behavior, because I argued that a lot to, with my coaches, but I have to let it go, I get out, because if I just bottle it up, it gets even worse. Um, I was not able to let it go. So I would try to teach the other route to go. Yeah, that's my own experience. Wasn't that successful?